a snake. How would you describe a snake to someone who's never seen one? It's long, has scales, a forked tongue, no legs. But here's another snake. It's also scaly, fork-tongued and legless. Clearly, it's shaped and colored differently, but how else can you tell them apart? For all intents and purposes, they're the same. The oldest written documents that we, we have are cuneiform tablets that are lists of the names of animals. So this is something that's been going on for a long, long time. In several uh, traditions, the Aborigines of, of Australia, uh, for instance, uh, until something has a name, it doesn't exist. And even in, in Western tradition, until a child was christened and given a name, um, that child was, didn't achieve personhood. So we, we have this idea that giving of, of names is a very critical, important, and, and almost uh, magical thing. Taxonomy or the science of designing species seems to be one of the most controversial parts of biology. People get really upset with each other. Species are not reality. Bio biology does not define species. We define species. You know, biologists often talk about the species problem and the challenges of defining species. And I think sometimes that gets carried over into the public as scientists don't know what they're talking about. That they're, you know, oh, they can't even, they can't even define it. Uh, species is a word that uh, elicits a lot of uh, debate. That's oh, right. Wait a minute. That's just bullshit. What are you talking about? Obviously, this issue has some people very riled up. But why? Why get so upset over a question as simple as, what is a species? Why does it matter? To use the Endangered Species Act, we have to use the best available science to define a species. And so there's legal definitions that we need to apply, and sometimes they fit and sometimes they don't fit. And so kind of the biology and the law have to mesh somehow. A lot of agencies are strapped for money. They don't, they're not looking for new species to protect. And in fact, the ones they have to protect present a lot of headaches to them. I do know even right now that, you know, if they find a bit of uh, feathers or furs or, or pelts or something like that, you know, LaGuardia Airport, and then they're wondering whether an endangered species has been poached or something like that, all we need to do is sequence a few hundred base pairs of DNA and we can identify whether species is and sometimes even what part of the species range it came from. Like if you're looking at ivory, they can identify the country of origin. I think new ideas about what species are in microbiology will have an impact on you know, the, the legal ease of, of biotechnology. For a long time we didn't know that microsporidians were fungi and they cause pneumonia in AIDS patients. Not knowing their fungi would result in treating them or treating the patients in a, in a certain way. Once we realized they were fungi, then they might be treated another way. So that would, knowing those species and which ones are involved, would be a big deal. If we need to describe an animal or figure out what species it is, where do we start? Well, if we've been doing this for thousands of years, Shouldn't there be a rule book or something? Some sort of system? The answer is yes and no. Biologists have come up with over 22 species concepts, but they all use different parameters, and not a single one can be used for all types of life. Hence, the species problem. Now, if we take a closer look, we can sort this jumble into three groups. A species can be defined based on either character similarity, evolutionary theory, or genetics. And the three most popularly used and debated concepts are from each of these groups. The morphological species concept, the biological species concept, and the phylogenetic species concept. So let's bring back our snake and try to classify him based on these concepts.
If we use morphology, we need to look at things like shape, color, size, or other physical characteristics. If we use the biological method, we need to test whether it can interbreed to produce viable offspring. And finally, if we use the phylogenetic approach, we need to compare the genetic differences between this species and its closest relatives to see how it has evolved through time. This seems pretty straightforward for snakes, but it's not always that easy. Not all these concepts can be applied to every organism. So you look for morphological gaps between what you're looking at as a new species and what occurs in all of the related species. You try to stay away from just things like color or size because those are extremely variable, but structural details, the shape of various body parts, uh, the famous one that we use a lot is male genitalia are often extremely different between one species and another. I think I look for consilience. So multiple pieces of evidence telling the same story. So I'd want to see genetic differences between populations. If I was going to call them different species, I'd want to see different behaviors or morphologies, maybe adaptations. Um, and then I like it all makes sense geographically. You know, different species might be living in different places. And if all those things are pointing in the same direction, then I'll say, yeah, they're two different species. We thought the morphology was pretty good. And it turns out it can lead to a lot of mistakes. Many of our, our crop plants, such as wheat, are cases where two different species have cross hybridized and then doubled their, their uh, chromosome number. Within anthropology, because we have to apply the, the definition to organisms that are long dead, the application of that definition is a little more difficult because we can't do the test of interbreeding. Paleontologists, it's strictly limited to morphology. So you could name a single bone, a single tooth, or a complete skeleton. A common problem for bird biologists is that there are a few suites of birds that do hybridize. And so the biological species concept breaks down. The molecular techniques are reinforcing a lot of just the good old morphological concept. With birds, you, we might say that that morphology includes the shape of their syrinx, the types of songs they produce, which is behavioral and morphological, and often it's song that keeps birds separated. Unfortunately, fungi don't breed very well in captivity. So the biological species um, is pretty much out for a lot of our studies. So we use the morphological species concept, the phylogenetic species, this is more recent, we look at a particular part of the DNA and see if that's unique. And if we can find a set of unique characteristics, then we can define that as a species. You know, how can you classify something by a biological species concept based on sexual reproduction for organisms that, that don't sexually reproduce? So one of the big problems in microbial biology is that a lot of things look alike. We look to other properties besides the morphology. Uh, you know, for example, are there some specific things like, can this organism move? It may have a flagellum that drives it through the, the medium. Uh, what kind of metabolisms can it conduct is a biggie for, for microbiology. You could take one of these named species, like E. coli, and you could study it at higher resolution and learn that, in fact, a named species is something more like a genus in microbiology. You know, sometimes you don't have access to genetic variation, so you can't use a phylogenetic species concept. You might have to use a morphological species concept. But the phylogenetic species concept, if you work with other than that concept, you will always underestimate the true levels of biodiversity. Since these definitions don't work all the time, sometimes decisions come down to subjectivity, and this can cause a lot of confusion. In fact, this range of opinions has led biologists to classify themselves into groups. If they tend to lump organisms together, they're called lumpers. <laughs> 
And if they tend to separate them out, they're called splitters. And just like the creatures they study, sometimes they can't decide which one they are. When you see uh, claims in the, the newspaper, where we, we often see these things, and the, the headline will be sort of splashy and tell you that a new species has been found, but when you read the details, you see that not everyone is, is necessarily on board. Defining the splits between Homo habilis and Homo erectus is essentially an arbitrary activity. That is, that there's not a point where somebody woke up and said, I'm Homo erectus today, but I was Homo habilis yesterday. When does that different population become a species? There's some subjectivity in that. How far along the divergence path does it have to go before you say, voila, a species? It's easy to go into the laboratory and sequence some DNA and say, these fish are genetically different. But to figure out what that means is, is much harder. It's sort of like the color red. Well, that's the color red. Well, if an artist came up and said, well, no, that's actually magenta, or that's, that's pink, or something. Oh, I said, well, I, what's the difference? You know? And so species, at least a lot of these species uh, that we have trouble with, they are basically like a, like a rainbow. You can, it goes from one, one species to another very gradually and, and basically seamlessly. If you expect it to be right all the time, you're going to be a very unhappy systematist. So all of those species concepts go from being extremely useful and operational in concept to being very mushy in practice. So in reality, scientists have to use a variety of concepts when describing a new species. They're used independently or together, and the conclusions vary depending on who's doing the work. But one thing's for sure, only humans have the gumption and the will to take on the task. Different species concepts are competing, but they're just competing among different groups of scientists who work with different kinds of data and different kinds of organisms. The myth is that there's an absolute definition and that there's an absolute thing that is a species that fits all situations. The way I like to look at it is that it's a, uh, a tool for us, for humans, to understand the diversity of life that we have around here. By 1987, you know, official people adopted this idea that you, you have to be more than 30% different from something in order to belong to a different species. Um, this cutoff, if applied to us, would group us into the same species as all the primates. So you and the lemur over there in the zoo are just strains of the same species. I tend to think of species as um a static entity and taxonomists I think are often born with little boxes in our brain and we want to put each species in a separate little box and and make it tidy but species are dynamic and they're changing over time because populations are changing over time um, so I think in describing a species it's almost like trying to um, capture a part of a flowing stream that's moving and changing all the time, and we're trying to put those little parts in boxes. We really need to embrace the, the fuzziness of species because that highlights everything we know about biology, that evolution takes place, this is how evolution creates new species. Um, and so it's not a species problem, but I'm, I'm not really sure what the word for it should be, like species joy or whatever, but I feel like there's, that, that, that's a really important aspect. I think a lot of scientists recognize we don't know the truth. We try to get close to the truth. We try to minimize that distance between our estimates and what we think are true parameters out there. But in some ways, it's the process that matters. A friend of mine says the truth is between the models. So it's in making contrasts. And I think that really holds true with species definitions. I don't think it's about being right. I think a species is a byproduct of how the human mind works. A it's a reflection of our need to kind of simplify the world and to categorize and to divide things up in as simple of a way as we can and still capture a lot of meaning. So next time you hear the word species, remember it's describing two fundamentally different things. It's both a real creature 
and an abstract category.